It's when it's all said and done. When it is all said and done. Our sermon text is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. And this is going to be a two, maybe three part series that we'll be talking about today. When it is all said and done. Can y'all see that picture? I have been attending, seems like this year, more funerals already than I did last year. And no doubt about it, unless <coughs> the Lord comes first, you and I are all going to die. We're all going to touch a dying pillow. There is no two ways about it, save the Lord come first. And what does John say in the Revelation? Blessed are those who die in the Lord. That's our aim. That's our goal, to die in the Lord. These person that's in this casket doesn't know who's around and what's going on. But it's for certain that you and I, no doubt about it, will die. So it's my prayer that we live our life in such a way that we make the choices that we will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. (coughs) All right, let's talk about what we're going to talk about. Number one, I want to show what so many of us strive for and covet I want to show what so many of us Christians and others in the world, what we spend so much of our energy on. What is so important for you and I that we, it consumes most of our days, most of our thoughts. It, 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 it governs our decision making. All right. We're going to see what the word of God has to say about what you and I strive for and covet. That's our first objective. All right. I only have two today and we'd be lucky if we get to the second one. Number two, to show the conclusion of the matter, to show when it's all said and done. That's what we want to do, all right? Second Corinthians, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> Second Corinthians chapter number five. That's our New Testament book. I'll be there in a second if I can find it in my Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, what I say, verse 1, yes, that's what I believe I said. Let's read, it's the English Standard Version. Paul says, for we know that if this tent, this tabernacle, that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God. This is his assurance that he knows for the Christian. We have a building from God. A house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent, in this tabernacle, we groan, this body in other words, we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. In other words, we're looking forward to heaven. Are you making, does it make sense? We as children of God should be. He says, if, that means contingency predicated upon, If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, while we're still in this earthly body, we groan being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the spirit as a guarantee. He's talking about the Holy Spirit as an earnest, a down payment. Paul talks about in Ephesians as well. So we are always of what? Good courage because of what we have. Are you following that? All right. We know that while we are at home in the body, we are away from the Lord. For we walk by what? Faith and not by sight. Yea or yes, we are of good courage. And we would rather be away from the body and at home with the Lord. So whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to do what? Please him. We make it our goal to please him, God. Verse 10 is our text, highlight, underline. For, introducing the reason. For we must all, everybody, appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Let that sink in, beloved. 
we must all appear. All of us, even when if he comes, when, when he comes, if you have not died and in this casket with your bodies uh, 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 laying cold and hands folded, you and I are going to have a judgment. No two ways about that. All right. So he says, for we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. What purpose? So that each one may receive what is due for what he, all right, has done in the body, whether good or evil. You and I are going to be judged according to what we individually have done or not have done. Christianity is not a religion of I don't do this, I don't do this. Christianity is a proactive religion. I do this, I do this. If you have faith, it's going to be demonstrated by your works. Are you following that? So Paul says, when it's all said and done, guess what? We're going to appear before the judgment seat of God. And there's no two ways about it. Now, let's show, again, what so many of us strive for and covet and lose sight of the fact that when, we, when it's all said and done, you die and you can take nothing with you. Let's talk about it. Do you all see this picture right here? Who's the picture on this $100 bill? Good old Ben Franklin. Good old Ben Franklin. And this right here, this money... You know, some of us even get excited when we see that picture of money. Me, I'm one of them. You still put a $100 bill in my hand, I get excited too, right? But when you see money like this, it, 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 it gets you excited because money gives us a feeling of power, does it not? It gives us a sense of self-worth or value on sometimes that, hey, I am somebody. I, I'm okay. I'm doing this. Most of us identify ourselves by our profession. Rather than looking at ourselves as a Christian, when somebody says, what do you do for a living or the first thing that our first thing we identify, not just asking what our profession, but we I'm a I'm a this I'm a that we describe ourselves mainly by our profession. I'm a freight relocation specialist. Womp womp, trunk driver, right? Truck driver. No. And, And that's what we identify. But what should be our highest calling? What should be the way in which we identify? I'm a child of God. I'm a Christian. Look with me real quick at Ecclesiastes. Before I read Ecclesiastes, I'm going to show you all something. Remember in 2 Kings chapter 2, um, 1 Kings chapter 2, if you're taking notes, we're talking about Solomon now. And in 2 Kings chapter, 1 Kings chapter 2, Solomon is praised for his faithfulness. Do you remember that? 2 Kings, 1 Kings chapter 2, he is praised for his faithfulness. And then he asked of the Lord. The Lord has told him to ask, and he does not ask for treasure. He does not ask for riches. He does not ask for all this military might. He asked for what? Wisdom. So that he may govern God's people. You remember that? And he starts out so good, and the Lord says, because you have not asked for all these other things, not only will I give you this wisdom, but I'm going to do what? I'm going to give you great abundances too. Are you remember that? Are we following that? That's 1 Kings chapter 2, all right? But in Ecclesiastes, towards the latter part of his life, Ecclesiastes means the preacher. And Solomon has made some treacherous decisions. He has allowed his money, his possession, and his desire for women and, and, and power and making allegiances by other nations and marrying women to lead his heart astray from God. What are we saying? Money can cause you and I to make decisions that are not best for us spiritually. All right? So let's introduce our text, Ecclesiastes chapter 5. The key word to this book is vanity, emptiness, nothingness. Chapter 5, verse 10, he who loves money will not be satisfied with money. You can stop right there. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money. Have you ever known people that got a lot of money, but they still try to make what? More money. But you remember the old expression, more money, more? There it is, all day long. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. What are they lacking? Starts with a C. Contentment. See that? Nor, nor, is, nor is he uh, uh, satisfied, nor, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This also is what? Vanity. When goods increase, 
they increase, uh, when goods increase, they increase who eat them. And what advantage has their owner but to see them with his eyes? <clears throat> Sweet is the sleep. Uh, oh, I, I, uh, I, I missed a verse. Hold on. Did I miss a verse? No, am I at verse 12? Oh, I didn't miss a verse. Okay. Sweet is the sleep of a laborer, whether he eats little or much. But the full stomach of the rich will not let him sleep. There is a grievous evil that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by the owner to his hurt. Slow down right there. Riches were kept to the owner by his, to, to his own hurt. You remember uh, the rich young ruler? Let me take my knees. Let me tear down these barns and do what? Build bigger ones. And the Lord says, thy fool, tonight thou soul will be required of thee. And to who shall these things belong to? The point that we're trying to make, real joy and real happiness is found not in just collecting things, but sharing. And I'm going to show that from the scriptures. He says, this is the grievous evil that I've seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owner to his hurt. And those riches were lost in a bad venture. And he is uh, and he is father of a son, but he has nothing in his hand. As he came from his mother's womb, he shall go again, naked as he came, and shall take nothing for his toil that he may carry away in his hand. What did he just say? You can't take this with you when you die, what you've toiled so hard for. The biggest impact that you and I can have on someone is not necessarily money, but it's spiritual. It's spiritual. Oftentimes, we think we can solve the world's problems. Have you ever known what our government does when it comes to school and education? They think if we just throw more money at the problem, it's going to be better. Has it worked? Absolutely not. But if we would just go back 40, 50, 60 years, when you had God in, in the schools, things was much different, was it not? But let's just throw more money at it. That's the answer to it. Well, if the teachers don't love God and don't know God, pray tell, we got problems. If the teachers think that you're primordial slob, why would they value the child? Do you see it? So the system is all wrong. You, you work and we labor sometimes for so many things and we put such a high uh, 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 focus on so many things and you cannot take it with you when you die. Verse 16 says, this also is a grievous evil. Just as he came, so shall he go. And what gain is there to him who toils for the wind? Moreover, all the days he eats in darkness and much vexation and sickness and in anger. I showed my sons the other day this video of these very celebrities and how they had this wealth, but they're not happy. And it showed from Jay-Z, the rapper, to uh, what's the it's a one rock lady. She's dead now. Not Lady Gaga, but the other one. I forget her name. And she's dead now. And then it was it's, it's a YouTube video, and I showed, and they were, they were doing interviews, and, and they were ex- trying to explain, you know, just because y- you get all this stuff and you think that you're going to have this. They had uh, stars from Australia and real famous people from everywhere, and they said, it's emptiness. It's nothingness. There's still a void. Though they have all this. So I was having this conversation with my boys. I was like, yes, you need to have some money to be able to provide for yourself. All right? I, I, I get that. I grant that. But that's not the end all be all of life. But that's the focus of so many people. And we emphasize to our children so much, go out and get a good job so you can have a good living. Is that wrong? No. But do you emphasize just as much, if not more, the spiritual side and the fact that you're going to die? And then to whom shall these things be when you are dead? Did it really matter then? This is what Solomon, the wisest man at the time, comes to realize that all this stuff that I, that I did and all this stuff that I didn't keep myself from, it's really nothing. It's really nothing. All right. Verse 10 again. He who loves money will not be satisfied with money, nor he who loves wealth with his income. This is also this is also vanity. This is also is vanity. First Timothy, chapter six, verse 10 for the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving, this desire, this longing, this wanting that some have wandered away from the faith, notice, and pierced themselves with many sorrows, with many pains. A lot of us, you know, hey, I had to learn. Hey, I, let, me, let me just be candid with you. Well, I chased that dollar at one point pretty hard, all right? I chased it. I'm not saying this to be braggadocio, but I'm always thinking about some business venture or some Ponzi scheme so I can rip y'all off, all right? <laughs> I'm choking on the latter part. 
somewhat. But <laughs> I'm going to sell you some dreams as long as I'm at the top and follow me that money, baby. Follow me that money. You know, it, it, it is because you, you, it weighs on you all the time, the constant need of money, the emphasis that our society places, uh, places on a piece of paper. Right? But, but notice what Paul says to Timothy. This craving, through this craving, many have wandered away from the faith. They have left what's most important, chasing money. And they have forgot that, guess what? Boy, you're going to die. And you're going to have to give an account to God. And he has no care about how much you had left in your bank account, but rather what you did with what he blessed you with. All right? Am I saying money is evil in and of itself? No, that's not what this is teaching. Remember, one of the richest men was, was the most faithful man. Job, did we forget that? There was none other like him. That's not what I'm saying. But let's just be candid. How many of us have the patience like, like, like Job? We may as well be honest with this thing, all right? We may as well be honest. All right, let's talk about money some more. Luke 12, 15. And he said to them, take care and be on guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. Man, how many of us, do you know what about six years ago was the number one business? Storage units. Storage (laughs) units. Uh, Prior to that, it was check cashing places and stuff like that, like in Mississippi and Alabama, all right? But anyways, about six years or seven years ago, the number one business was storage units. Storage units, think about that. We love our stuff. You better not get rid of my junk. That's not junk. That's my stuff. I'm going to go build me this place right here. Are you, are you going to use it? Uh, um, don't worry about that. <laughs> Ain't that how we do? Get mad if somebody even talked to us about our junk. And it's junk. I call your stuff junk. You think it's junk because you don't take care of it. You let it get up there and the moths and rust and all that get in there and eat it up anyways and it's dirty. When you could be giving away and letting somebody use it, he says, guard against all covetousness, for your life does not consist in the abundance of possessions. The Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 6, verse 19 to 21, do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. We need to stop right here and read that part. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth. What's the point that he's making here? Don't make it a priority to just amass all this stuff. You know what one of Solomon's main problems was? He wasn't sharing and giving it away as fast as he was getting it. And he allowed that stuff to go to his head. We can all do it. Let's just be honest. All of us are rich. Every last one of us in here are rich by the world standard, are we not? I'm sure we watch the world news and, uh, and see other things like that. We are rich. Let, I, I watched a, a documentary the other day in, about South Africa and the Cape and how they're struggling with water. How many of us can turn on the faucet and let the shower get hot before we even get in there? Every last one of us. And, that, and they have water wars, even in California right now, presently. All right? This is, this is stuff that's going on in our own backyard. So all of us, when we're talking about the rich, this is us and not squandering our possessions. Don't take this stuff for granted is what point we're trying to make. Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures where? In heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. Think about it. Christ Jesus came to this earth. He hung, he bled, he died. I was thinking, Brother Brad read our invitation uh, before the Lord's Supper, and I was reading afterwards, and I was reading in John, and this point came across to me today. Jesus is already dead, right, when they come to him. But the other two thieves are alive, and it says it breaks their legs. They break their legs. Let that think about this. Think about how vile the cross is that, man, you're going to take, and you know they didn't give them no anesthesia. They take something and crush their legs so that they can stop pushing up so they can breathe. What am I saying? Jesus Christ died a horrific death so that you and I could be with him eternally in heaven. Don't lose focus on, on, the, on the celestial for this earthly stuff. Don't get so worried about this possession here and covetous all these things here that you lose sight of heaven and the treasure in heaven. Does that make sense? 
That's the point we're trying to drive home. Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Do we believe that? What does David say? I was young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor seed begging bread. Do we believe that? Oh, I believe that. I, I absolutely believe that. Hebrews 13, verse 5, keep your life free from the love of money and be content with what you have. Parents, are we teaching our children to be content? Grandparents, are you teaching your grandbabies to be content? Parents, are you and I content ourselves? Let me just tell you this right here. This thing right here works on me right here, trying to have contentment. Because... I want more. <laughs> There's just no other way to say it. I'm going to be flat out honest with you. All right. I want more. That's right. If a new pickup come out with some new big wheels, hamburger. I got to, I want it. I want it. How many of y'all been like me go to the Dallas Fair and y'all always meander right through to the truck station? <laughs> a lot of us men like to get those big old trucks. Hey, you know, the pickup truck that you got right now is perfectly fine, but it, it's not new. And this one has a better braking system. That's how we convince ourselves, a better braking system, right? Yeah. We got to live our life, and we got to be content with what you have. For he has said, now this is a spiritual blessing, this is a promise. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we can confidently say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? The, the, the latter part of this Hebrews is, is, is the gravy, knowing that the Lord will never leave us or forsake us. And we have confidence and we can say the Lord is my helper. He's my come along. He's the one that stands beside me. He's my go between. He's my advocate. He's my intercessor. He's the one by, and through whom I pray. Because of his blood that's shed. This, this right here ought to, ought to put some chills on you because you know what you have in Christ Jesus. I ought to be content with what I have and live my life free from the love of money. First Timothy 6, verse 6 through 7. But godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. Let that sink in. Godliness with contentment is. It's great gain. Boy, we sacrifice a lot of things. I can't tell you how much time and thoughts I have sacrificed chasing the almighty dollar. Man, I got all kinds of business schemes. and <laughs> to, to, I'm like, you know, what are we going to do tomorrow night, right? Come up with another way to be a billionaire. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I got all kinds of stuff to run through my mind on, on how to make money. And, and a lot of us do, you know, and, like, and it's not wrong to make money. But if it comes, if we spend more time on that than we do on godliness and studying his word and teaching it and using it. See, we got don't lose sight of what the money's for. All right. Let me get to that point. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Here's the text. We brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. There goes back to my first slide. King Tut, his body and his jewelry and all that stuff is on exhibit. And a year or two ago, it came to Dallas and they charge you to see all his stuff and he ain't getting no royalties. <laughs> Let that sink in. Let that sink in. He ain't getting jack, but they making some money off of him. You can't take nothing with you when you die. That's the point we're trying to say. What's our application? We must use our money and possessions not solely on ourselves, but also to aid others. Here's my text, Ephesians 4.28. He who steals must steal no longer, but rather he must labor, performing or working with his own hands what is good. What reason, Paul? So that he will have something to share with the one who has need. Not everything you make or I make is meant to be spent for us. Parents, are we teaching our kids that their allowance, if you give them one, is not only to be spent on themselves but to try to use it for someone else? Do we teach our kids that they need to share? 
uh, you know, I, I, I got this Dave Ramsey thing, and I halfway read it sometime, and I thought I was doing it right until Brother Brad told me something about the three buckets. I was like, where'd you get that from? He's like, from Dave Ramsey. It's like, well, I need to stop skimming through this thing and actually read it, okay? <laughs> I listened to a show or something, and I think I got it all the way down, and I don't. But one of the things that he has is, is I call it sharing. It's a bucket and sharing. How often do we share of our means with other people? Got to ask yourself that question. How often do I share of what my hands have, have worked and labored for with someone else who has a need? How often do I ask in prayer, God, put me in the direction of those who need something? Do you see what I'm saying? All right. I, I got to admit, I was preaching this lesson and going through it. It, it works on me. Luke three eleven, and we would answer and say to them, the man who has two tunics or tunics, coats in other words, is to share with him who has none. And he who has food is to do likewise. <clears throat> if, that, if, 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 if Luke three eleven don't get it, I don't know what's going to get it. If you have abundance, what are you supposed to do with it? Share it. What did Solomon do? He built bigger barns. What did the rich man do? Built bigger barns. Instead of sharing it, he housed it. Instead of sharing it, we need to share with him who has none. What was the early church known for? No man said that this was of his own, but they laid it at the apostles' feet so they could distribute to anyone that had a need. Let that sink in. Talking about being in Christ Jesus. Galatians 6.10, do good unto all men, especially they of the household of faith. Are you following it? All right. I don't know. Uh, <coughs> that was my first point. Uh, and I, I clock myself doing better than this. But I'm going to introduce this. We'll pick this up. What's another thing? Remember our first point, things that we so often covet. And, and, and cause us to take the emphasis off the spiritual and emphasize the carnal or the earthly more. Self-indulgence, all right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this up here, and, uh, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll read a little bit, and the lesson's yours, all right? In fact, how about this? I'll just put this verse up here, Ecclesiastes 2, verse 3 and 11. I think we got through, what, four slides? <laughs> uh, okay. But anyways, you see this picture right here? Self-indulgence. Oftentimes, that's that, the, 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 uh, it's, it's called hedonism. Hedonism means that which panders to the flesh, that which gratifies what the flesh, what the body wants. And we spend a lot of our time trying to make sure that we please ourselves. What do you mean, preacher? When it's late at night and you got a sweet tooth. <coughs> Amen. You got a sweet tooth. You got to, you got to, you got to have it. You're going to do whatever you need to do. How many of us have made some late night runs to Whataburger because we had a craving? Got to have it just like you like it. And you know they open 24-7. We got a group here that goes after service on Sunday nights faithfully. Faithfully. They even know the lady's name and when she left. I know her name now, too, but I'm not going to say their names. <laughs> We got to have it. You know, we gratify our flesh. Self-indulgence, man. You just look at it. You just ain't happy with one cookie or three cookies. Remember, you used to get three cookies. Now how many of us get nutty butters and we get more than three? We do more than just one, like Lay's potato chips. And that self-indulgence. I'm going to put this passage up here and then we'll read it. Ecclesiastes 2, 10, 11. And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. I kept my heart from no pleasure for my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it, and behold, all was vanity and striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. Self-indulgence. Whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. Self-indulgence. Hedonism. That which panders to the flesh. All right? What's the point that we're trying to talk about? When it's all said and done, and the final roundup of human affairs, the things that which gratify this fleshly body oftentimes war against the spirit. And self-indulgence and not holding back whatever I want causes us. It costs us. Remember, our body is a temple of God. 
right? But all right, I got to put a pen knife in this. We'll, we'll have to pick up the next time with that on all these others, okay? And uh, um, so that's all, folks. <laughs> this was actually my, my lesson right here, Ecclesiastes 12 and Matthew chapter uh, 20, uh, 22, uh, uh, verse 23, in uh, chapter 23. But we'll pick up with, with, uh, with that one. We'll finish out right there. This is what I was trying to get to, the conclusion of the matter. What are we trying to do? What are we, what, what are we trying to understand better? That, that there are certain things that are really not worth first-rate energy. John 6, labor not for the meat which perishes, but that which endures for everlasting life. What does he mean? Is he saying don't work? No. Don't spend first-rate energy on second-rate things. That's the point. That's the point. Don't ever lose sight of, the, of, of God's great love and sin in the Son and how he views sin. Don't ever forget that you and I are going to face judgment one day. And, and what matters most is not how much I treated myself and how much money I amassed, but did I live a faithful life? Did I help out others along the way? Did Christ, could, could somebody say, I see Christ in me? That's what matters the most. In Acts chapter 18, verse 8, the Corinthians heard the gospel message that a Savior died for men. They believed that message, and according to that message, they were baptized. If you need the prayers of the saints, want to put the Lord on a baptism, got questions, whatever way we can help, 